Good morning everyone, I'm Anna Golinelli and I'm a PhD student on Amplitude Technologies. The subject of my thesis will be the CEP stabilization on a CPA system. In this video we introduce the main concept of a high peak power lasers and surpass amplification technique. Over the last 20 years, laser physics has experienced a rapid growth in high peak power laser systems. Nowadays, this kind of laser source is fully developed and commercially available for different applications. Amplitude Technologies is a pioneer company in providing high peak power laser systems, mainly targeting to these applications, particle acceleration, attosecond size, and pumping X-ray lasers. When we talk about high peak power laser system, we are referring to a system which is able to provide laser pulses with two main features, high pulse energy from millijoule to joule and short time duration, femtosecond scale. Beam intensity can reach value higher than 10 to 15 gigawatt per centimeter square on the beam focus. In order to reach such high level of energy, we need to amplify the pulses. The gain medium should fulfill two main requirements. It should have high energy storage capacity. The gain bandwidth should be broad enough to support the amplification of femtosecond pulse. This type of material exists but is often characterized by a small stimulated emission cross-section. This affects the amplification efficiency since high energy extraction occurs only when the input laser fluid is of the order of the saturation fluid. As we can see from the formula, low cross-section implies high saturation fluence. For solid materials, this fluence is around 1 to 20 millijoule. If we want to efficiently amplify a short pulse, let's say 100 femtosecond, the corresponding intensity on the crystal that is calculated as the ratio of input fluence and time duration would be of the order of 10 to 200 terawatt per centimeter square. This value is well above the damage threshold of the material. The way to circumvent this problem arises with the surpulse amplification technique. To overcome the limit of the damage threshold, we, sh we could play on both the input energy fluence and the pulse duration. Since high energy fluence is required for obtaining efficient amplification, the only degree of freedom is the pulse duration. CPA technique is finally based on this principle. The short input pulse is firstly stretched up to a thousand times of its original pulse duration. By this way, it could be amplified without damaging the gain medium. Subsequently, the beam is recompressed to get high peak power. The CPA technique allows to fill the two conditions for a good amplification that are input fluence of the order of saturation fluence, intensity on the gain medium lower than damage threshold. By this way, we can efficiently extract energy from bond broadband with high saturation fluence gain medium. It is clear now that this technique is suitable for implementation of high peak power lasers at a relatively low cost and with reasonable size. Besides avoiding gain medium damage, there is another advantage thanks to low input intensity. To understand this, we should first introduce the P integral parameter. As the intensity of the pulse crossing a medium is high, the refractive index becomes intensity dependent according to the expression. Since the intensity of the beam is spatially varying, we can count the amount of wavefront distortion over a propagation length by the B integral. For a Gaussian beam, the B integral will cause self-focusive of the whole beam on the medium. Keeping the input intensity low helps to keep the B integral to a reasonable values, which can avoid critical beam wave from distortion. Once we understand the concept of chirpulse amplification, we will now analyze in detail each module that composes a CPA system. The first question we should point out is how far we need to stretch the pulse. To get the answer, we should focus again on two conditions. First, we should avoid damaging the medium, that, that implies the input intensity should be lower than the damage threshold. Second, we want to efficiently extract the energy stored in the middle, that is, we should work at saturation fluence. The first condition places an upper bound on the intensity that the amplification medium can tolerate. 
The second condition establish an energy fluence that we would like to get. By simply reversing the, the formula, we obtain the minimum time duration for the pulse. For example, we can estimate the time duration in the case of titanium sapphire crystal with a damage threshold of 5 gigawatt per centimeter square and a desired operating fluence of 2 joule per meter centimeter square. From this data, we estimate a pulse duration of 400 picoseconds. After having estimated the chair pulse width, now we examine different possibilities to stretch the pulse. Let's first point out what it means. To stretch the pulse, we need to introduce purposely a delay between the spectral components of the pulse. This parameter is identified by group delay dispersion. Considering only the second order approximation, the chirp pulse duration is related to initial pulse duration by the equations shown, valid for a Gaussian pulse. Since we know the initial pulse duration and we already estimated the chirp pulse duration, we can obtain the group delay dispersion. There are three methods to introduce positive chirp, specially designed coatings, solid materials and grating pairs. Recalling the example of a 400 picosecond chirp pulse, we would need a group delay dispersion of about 10 to 6 femtoseconds that only grating pairs can provide. To determine the parameter for bidding this kind of stretcher, we can use a formula. This formula relates the group delay dispersion to the grating distance, the diffracted angle, the diffraction order and the groove density. Choosing a diffractive order of minus 1, a litre of incidence angle and the given the growth density, the most important parameter to play with for scaling the group, de the group delay dispersion is the distance between the gratings. Let's deal now with the amplification process. As we have already mentioned, it is important to saturate the amplifier to obtain good amplification efficiency. This means that the output fluence from the amplifier should be close or higher than the saturation fluence. Let's call E in the input energy and E out the output from the amplifier. Since we want to saturate the medium, we should satisfy the equations shown. That means that the output fluence should be equal to the saturation fluence. A is the beam size that is calculated as the area of a circle with 1 over E square radius. Since a certain value of output energy is required, we can scale the area by consequence. The second question is, how many passes in the amplifier we will need to reach E out? We can calculate it by knowing the single pass gain in approximation of small signal that is shown in the formula. As we see, the gain is depending on the pump fluence. According to the formula, since we know the input energy, the saturation fluence and the area, we can estimate the number of passes. We will now talk about about two different types of amplifiers, the regenerative amplifier and the multipass amplifier. We have already mentioned the importance of working at saturation fluence. However, for many materials, the saturation fluence is too high to be reached without damaging the crystal. This also depends on the restriction that is impossible to stretch the pass beyond the nanosecond scale. A way to obtain efficient amplification below the saturation fluence is simply multipass many times the gain medium. The regenerative amplifier is designed to permit from 10 to 100 passes inside the gain medium. It is basically composed by a resonant cavity, a pocket cell coupled with a polarizer and a gain medium. At first, the medium is lightened by the pump until its energy is fully absorbed by the gain medium. During this time, no voltage is applied to the poker cell. This enables to reject the input pulse. In fact, assuming an S-polarization for the beam input, the polarizer is choosing to reflect S-polarized beam and to transmit P-polarized beam. Since the poker cell is off and transparent to the beam, the input beam is rejected. Subsequently, after the first pass inside the poker cell, a half-wave voltage is applied. The second pass on the poker cell gives a half-wave retardation that changes linearly the polarization of the input B from S to P. The beam is not rejected and can pass through the medium. The high voltage is maintained for the time that the pulse takes to complete all the passes required on the crystal. This time can be calculated as the product between the number of passes required and the round-trip time. 
In this configuration, the bean double passes the, the Pockel cell, acquiring a phase retardation of 2p. That means that the polarization doesn't change. When the pulse has completed all the round trip required, after the first pass inside the Pockel cell, the voltage is switched to zero. Double passing the Pockel cells gives a half wave retardation that rotates the polarization. The S polarized beam is reflected by the polarizer and extracted. When the saturation fluence is low and the gain per single pass is high, the alternative to the regenerative amplifier is the multipass amplifier. This amplifier has no resonator and the beam is passing through the medium several times until the energy store is extracted. Different configurations are possible for this kind of amplifier and the design depends on the number of passes required. Let's now make a comparison between the regenerative and multipass amplifier. A regenerative amplifier operates with a near Gaussian mode that is insensitive to the mode of the seed. These ensure a high quality for the outward beam profile. On the other hand, the linear cavity allows for stray reflection from polarizer to propagate in the output direction, which lead to prepulses. This prepulsive will worsen the main pulse contrast. A multipass amplifier limits the propulses to the leakage from intracavity polarizer. Moreover, since there is no need for of pulse switching in a multipass amplifier, it is possible to reduce the pulse path through optical materials. This leads to a less temporal dispersion. On the other hand, the output beam quality between, be, depends on the input beam profile, the optics in the amplifier, the gain profile and the thermal lenses. Moreover, the design could lead to astigmatism if curved mirrors are not used on normal incidence. At the output of the amplification stage, we should find the compression system that can compensate the temporal dispersion. This means a compressor which can provide a negative group delay dispersion. A reasonable choice would be to use a grating compressor. Flipping the sign of dispersion is simply obtained by placing an imaging system within the grating per compressor. As for the stretcher, we can use the same formula to calculate the distances between the gratings. However, in this case, we should design the compressor to compensate the group delay dispersion that arises from both the stretcher and the propagation inside the amplification medium. In this video, we briefly summarize the basic concept and design of CPA laser systems. This technique, in addition to allowing the generation of high peak power laser pulse, it is also flexible and adaptable to many different configurations, depending on the requirements. The CPA is in fact applied to existing laser system at a relatively low cost.